final session is on implementation. And the panelists, if you can step forward, please. We have uh, Remy Bellock, who is Chief Executive Officer of the National HBPA. Vince Gabbert is Executive Assistant to the President of the Keeneland Association. Ed Martin, President of the Association of Racing Commissioners International. Lisa Underwood, Executive Director of the Kentucky Horse Racing Commission. And Alex Walger, President and CEO of NTRA. And to conduct the panel, uh, I'd like to introduce Jim Gagliano, President of the Jockey Club. Good morning. Thank you, Ed. <clears throat> and uh, thank you, everyone, for your two days of participation. These have been wildly successful meetings, as they have been for the first two uh, Welfare and Safety of the Racehorse Summits. Um, I was chatting with Dr. Polk a few moments ago, and, and he reminded me that, that this this event was really uh, was born with an idea from Della Hancock uh, a number of years ago who, who thought it was important to bring a group together, a group of deep thinkers who care uh, a great deal about this business and about this industry, and they could come to a, a place and, and freely exchange ideas and come up with, with a, a list of priorities and timelines that we could all act upon, and I, I thank you all for that great idea. Um, I also want to thank the Jockey Club staff, the Grayson staff that's done a tremendous job putting this, this conference on. Uh, it's gone very well uh, in the Jockey Club manner. We are, we are on time, and I'm proud of that for, for those of you who wonder. Um, but I would be remiss without thanking everyone at Keeneland for the tremendous hospitality we've had. It makes the meetings uh, much more enjoyable to be in a setting like this and to be treated, uh, treated with such gracious hospitality. Uh, I thank Nick and, and everyone at Keeneland, Rogers, Vince, Julie, Jay, Becky, everyone, and I also thank GD for his work in, in video streaming this. I understand we've had more than a thousand people come and visit uh, the, the, web, uh, the website and are streaming this uh, coming from seven countries. So uh, it's not just limited to this group here. Uh, we, we ask you all to take the gospel and bring it out to the, to the rest of the world, but using technology we're able to do that today. Um, well, thank you, Ed, for doing introductions. Uh, with that, we'll just we'll get into uh, this implementation panel, which is really um, we thought it was important when we sat down and talked about what are the what, what's missing. Well, implementation. We have such good ideas, such good sound science, such good sound reasoning that the key is now to, to, to steal from Nick. Let's keep the momentum going. Let's 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 put our efforts and our energies now into taking some of these terrific ideas and bring them forward for reform for the, for the uh, collective uh, benefit of our business. Um, with that, I just, Jamie, put the, uh, a, a little more than a month ago, or a couple of months ago now, we received a letter from Congress asking us to provide a response to a number of questions that they had. And we looked upon it as a great opportunity, a terrific opportunity to tell the federal government about the collective efforts that we are all making in, in bringing uniformity and reform into our industry in the areas of safety and welfare of the horse, of the rider, and of the uh, integrity of the sport at large. Uh, we said it in that letter, and I, I think it really stands as the thesis statement for what we have been able to accomplish. We believe the record will indicate that more progress has been made during the past two years in these areas of our sport than in any other comparable time period in history. And for example, and I just want to remind you what this group, the seeds that this group has planted and, and the, and the um, conclusions, the elimination of steroids in racing, the establishment of our National Racetrack Accreditation Program, the establishment of EID, the establishment of the Racing Services Testing Lab, the great work that Dr. Peterson has put in, the establishment of our drug testing initiative. And you're going to hear a lot more about that this summer as we ramp up towards our roundtable conference. The creation of model legis legislation to in introduce the Interstate Racing Regulatory Compact, and we're going, to, we're going to hear about that on this panel. The establishment with, Ke with Keeneland of the Jockey Health Information System with Dr. Schumer's guidance. The widespread adoption of specific equipment rules to enhance safety of riders and horses. Many, too many to list, have been considered and 
Several have been adopted. The continued enforcement of the Jockey Club's rules that deny privileges of the American Stud Book to anyone who commits an act of cruelty to a thoroughbred. No doubt you've read press releases from the Jockey Club where we've stepped up and, and, and taken our responsibility there. With that, I want to take us to and give you some illustrations before we get into the panel about, about uniformity, about rules, how, how this industry collectively is able to promulgate them. And we'll begin with steroids. This chart is just a depiction of 10 states, and we've taken three, essentially three model rules, or three rules that, that are actually found in the accreditation process, and we want to illustrate how they're adopted. Uh, in the red, this is the adoption of the model rule as, as by a racing commission as, as described within the model rule. And then the pink is a slightly similar rule uh, regarding steroids. The next illustration is on TCO2 because I can't say that first word very well. Um, the TCO2 substances, and the, and the red again depicts the exact uh, adoption of the model rule uh, by racing commissions. Pink is, um, is a slightly different one, a uh, different interpretation, and, and yellow is indication of a, a, prog a, uh, a process. And then you, you, you go into the, the next end of the spectrum with NACIDs, which is more complex. Uh, I think uh, it was Dr. Arthur or Dr. Brownlich said that just yesterday when he described uh, how this is uh, a little bit more complex. And, and as a result, um, using the same commitment to the model rule, the, the adoption is a little bit different. It's not exactly the same, but it keeps to the spirit. I won't run through this because there's more words I can't pronounce very well. But the detail here depicts the differences of, uh, the next slide please, the, the, the actual details of, of why it's, it's, uh, it's a little bit different. So with that, we want to open up the panel today and, and talk about a number of different subjects. The first I'd like to call upon to give us background on the model rule process. Uh, Ed Martin, I'd like you to tell us a little bit of the history and how model rules work with your organization and how, how you bring them forward to racing commissions. Uh, thanks, Jim. <clears throat> the, uh, the model rule process uh, has been around, I think, longer than I think I've been alive. Uh, and that's a long time. Um, it, it has been an effort of uh, RCI to uh, try to uh, achieve some degree of uniformity and uh, make recommendations for regulatory rules to our members uh, to facilitate uh, their job of regulating the sport. Uh, the process starts with input. Ideas for model rules come to us from a variety of different directions. Come from organizations, come from symposiums like this, come from individuals. In some cases, they come from commissions who have found a particular way to address a regulatory issue in their jurisdiction to be effective and have recommended this to become a model for other commissions to adopt. When an idea comes to us, the first thing that happens is it's referred to our pertinent committee with responsibility on that particular subject matter. For instance, a recommendation that would come from the Racing Medication and Testing Consortium would be referred to our Drug Testing Standards and Practices Committee. A regulation a proposal with regard to equine welfare would, would go to our Regulatory Veterinarians Committee. Uh, from those committees, they would analyze it, accept it, change it, modify it, reject it, but they would render an opinion and it would then move to the RCI Model Rules Committee. Uh, the Model Rules Committee is composed primarily of uh, seasoned executive directors who have been doing this kind of uh, work for, for a while. They also, it is also fairly representative of uh, many of our major members. Uh, the chair of the Model Rules Committee is uh, probably the longest serving executive director in racing, even though he currently hails from a state that doesn't have a lot of racing, South Dakota. 
but you will not find a more detail-oriented attorney. And, and I mentioned the word attorney because a lot of our rules that come out of symposiums and summits like this are recommended to us not by attorneys, but when you make a rule, it, it's a, it's a, it has obviously legal implications. So we, at some point, attorneys need to be in this process. Um, and our model rules committee will will then do what they do on the committee. We send it out for comment to uh, all the major industry organizations. We post model rules on our website that are pending. We, we seek uh, public comment. We seek industry comment. Uh, we prefer uh, that there is an industry consensus before bringing a proposal to us. Sometimes that's possible and sometimes that's not. Um, from the Model Rules Committee, it then goes to the RCI Board, and the RCI Board and or full membership uh, then adopt the Model Rule. Now the Model Rule is our published uh, on, on our website, also uh, thanks to the Racetrack Industry Program at the University of Arizona. They've been tremendously helpful to us over the years in maintaining that on, on, on their website and, and keeping it in a form that uh, 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 that makes sense. Um, these are recommendations to our committees. We have no authority or power to say this is what you must do. That authority and power rests with individual racing commissions. But uh, we, we hold these up as a best regulatory practice, and uh, for, for the most part, there's, uh, uh, there's 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 very strong support among the regulators for the model rule process. So, so Lisa taking that from the model rule position, how does a state, a commonwealth like Kentucky that's become a real leader in adopting a lot of these, uh, a lot of these recommendations coming out of model rules, what's the process for you? How do you grab it and run with it? Sure. Um, we rely a lot on the model rules and um, over the last two years we have, two or three years actually, we have been very active in updating some of our rules and um, I started trying to think through how has that happened, how have we become more active. I think obviously the industry has realized we really needed to pull together. Um, but I, when I started thinking about this, I thought I think there are six keys to success here that have helped for us. Um, the first starts at the top. We have a very supportive governor, Governor Bashir, who appointed a very active racing commission. And we are blessed in Kentucky to have people with a wealth of experience and knowledge and a passion for the industry. Um, obviously, the equine industry is very important to Kentucky. So that has helped um, at the very beginning, and we have a very dedicated chair in Bob Beck. The governor has also helped us with some funding. Um, for a while there, we didn't really have the money to continue operating. <laughs> and um, he realized that and helped us help provide us funding, which helped us be able to hire staff. Um, some people we needed, and that's the second point. I feel like we have surrounded ourselves with a very good, capable, hardworking, passionate staff. I have a great deputy executive director in Mark Bilfoyle, who's got 22 years of experience. We were able to hire our first equine medical director. We've hired a new chief vet, and also Dr. Farmer. Um, we've just hired our first supervisor of peer mutual wagering. So having that staff in place who can take care of the operational aspect of, of the business helps free me up and Chairman Beck up and the rest of the commission up so that we can look at some of the big picture items that are out there and try to push forward. Uh, how, have you, how have you taken those model rules and tweaked them? Could you give us some examples and discuss why, why that you might sure. do that? Well, what we do, it's interesting as Ed was going through the process, we go through that same process on a state level. So I know we're going to end up talking about the compact and it will show um, it's ready. How, that can, how that can really streamline what we do at one level. We're going through on every state level. We have different committees. Um, so again, at our state level, we will um, assign whatever the relevant rule is to the particular committee. So if it's banning anabolic steroids, that went to the Equine Drug Research Council. When we looked at several of the safety initiatives, um, such as banning the front toe grabs, safety helmets, safety vests, that went to the Safety and Welfare Committee chaired by Betsy Lavin. Um, it goes through the committee and then would go to, to 
to the commission. After it goes through the commission, we go, we file it with the Legislative Review Commission, and they they take it to the Administrative Regulation Review Subcommittee. Do you want this kind of? It's a process. But sure, and, and and you tweak them because we work with the industry. It, right. it, it usually um, involves industry input. I mean, we always involve the industry. That was going to be one of my keys to success. In any of these rules we put forward, we will have meetings at the committee level where we have the industry come in and give us their comments. They've probably already given them at the RFI model rule level, but they'll come to Kentucky as well and give us some comments, and that is probably why the tweak would, would happen. Vince, you've spent lots of time in government, state government. Give us uh, some insights as to how how our industry and, and our rulemaking process is perceived by legislators. Well, I think, first of all, it's important to note that as the detail from the work groups comes out, and a lot of the things that you've already mentioned, Jim, in your opening remarks for this, is there's far more that unites us than divides us. And I think that government's view of interstate compacts and, and of how the industry works focuses on those on those pieces because it's easier for um, government from a oversight level um, to have the oversight without the intervention. Uh, they would much prefer that, I think, from a from a day-to-day -day standpoint. And I think from the from the view of the industry, especially here in Kentucky, um, it's viewed very favorably. Um, they feel that the industry works hand in hand with the government. That our goal is the same. Uh, that just like all of us in the room, we want a safer, better product with more fans, that's creating more revenue, and doing all the things that that we need to do from a process standpoint. Um, and our government leaders uh, were very fortunate in this state to have a lot of uh, back and forth uh, with both sides of the aisle. We have uh, champions for various causes. Um, depending on what the area is here in Kentucky, and from a government standpoint, we're very fortunate in that regard. We, in the Commonwealth here, there's a number of there's it's it's a great industry, and there's a lot of very engaged legislators that that and and other interested parties that care to care to debate the issues. Um, it, Alex, can you share with us the experience that that the NTRA has had inside the federal Beltway, and how the perceptions uh, are formed there, and and what your organization has done in that regard? The, the relationship that the, the industry has uh, with the federal government is, I would say in, in many respects, it's very good. As an agriculture-based uh, industry, we're well-respected. We have excellent support. We have excellent contacts. But there is an element in Congress, motivated primarily by the industry, by the way, not by Congress itself, but by people in the industry, for Congress to intervene in our industry. Um, I think that's important because anecdotally, we know that whenever there's an issue that arises or a concern that is expressed uh, by a member of Congress, most recently and uh, often uh, to Congressman Ed Whitfield, that is motivated uh, or at least supported by uh, a fair percentage of, our, uh, of, of people in the industry. I don't know what that number is. I don't have a poll. But there's a, there's a feeling, I think, by, by many of our, in our industry that uh, our problems are so deep and our division so wide that we have to have the heavy hand of federal, of, of, of federal authority to get it right. The fact of the matter is, as we have learned over the last couple of days and as I've learned over the last couple of years, uh, there is a... There's A, a lot of similarity and uniformity in this business. B, there's, there's a lot of will to bring states together. C, I don't see ultimately a lot of interest at the federal level in intervening. I think you're right. Government would much rather not intervene in these situations. The federal government truly has no interest in getting involved in especially gambling matters. But when they see an industry that they don't think is taking care of business, and those industry participants are stepping up saying, do something about this, they're going to respond. So it's important that at meetings like this, we take control of these issues and we demonstrate not just to Congress, but to our fans, to people who care. And keep in mind that ultimately that's what we're here for. I think it's often uh, many of us in these, in, these, in these congregations, we get together and we talk about things that are important to participants, horsemen, tracks, trainers, all the stakeholders we talk to are, 
are very internal and, and we get our paycheck from the business. But ultimately, the people who decide whether or not what we're doing is important here are the fans. Those are people who watch and wager on horse racing. And if we're not satisfying them, then we're wasting our time, ultimately, because they drive this business. And that's the ultimate motivator that we have found so important. And that's what Congress wants to hear. They want to hear that if Congress is reacting to fans, there are people who are saying, are they taking care of the horse? Are they, do they have the integrity we need on the, on the drug and medication side? How about wagering security? Is that there? Those are all ultimately concerns of fans, and we can never lose sight of that fact, that these are not just debates between participants. These are deep, important concerns of people who love the sport, who watch it, who wager on it, and who drive the sport economically. I certainly agree with you. Uh, that measuring stick of what our fans believe to be valuable is, is highly motivating, is the ultimate motivation for all of us. Um, Remy, to so the horsemen, what, what, what would the horsemen seek out of this, uh, out of the implementation process? What, can you summarize where the platform, what the horsemen really want? Well, I think that, um, and first of all, I want to likewise thank Ed Bowen and Nick Nicholson and everybody for this meeting. I think it's uh, it's a wonderful opportunity for us to, to get together and, and, uh, and Matt and everybody appreciate it. I think um, uh, having attended all, a lot of the model rules committee meetings, um, first of all, we talk about model rules. In actuality, we talk about recommended rules because oftentimes, you know, those rules will go to a state level and um, they'll, they'll be changed. And I think that there's a fundamental problem that we have is that if you get national HBPA and RCI and, and all the d different parties together to agree on a model rule, for example, the steroid rule, and it was a lot of hard work to get consensus, and then that rule comes back to Kentucky or New York or whatever, and then it gets changed because of, you know, regional uh, differences of opinion or because one state might want to say, you know, we're tougher on crime than the other, or whatever it might be, that uh, really slows the process down and, 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 and doesn't help it much. Because then what happens is that the horsemen go, well, we worked so hard to get consensus, and, and now the rule looks completely different. We have to have a process that, and maybe the racing compact is the solution to this, that once we do have that consensus, that hard-fought consensus, that that rule gets passed as is. So that everybody knows that that's what we negotiated, that's what we bargained for, that's what's going to come down the pipe. Um, the other uh, question I have as far as the federal intervention and all that horsemen have is that the way I see it, uh, no matter what the federal government may say, you still have a state's rights issue that states have the ability to regulate their sports. So are we creating another layer of regulation uh, if, if, if we go to the federal government route as opposed to building a better mousetrap. Um, and I think one important thing I've, I've noticed as far as the process we now have that Ed uh, described is, uh, is how do we can keep the momentum going between meetings. Oftentimes we'll do some good work at a model rules committee meeting, we'll have input from the horsemen, but then we kind of lose momentum because we have so many things on our plates between meetings and, and having a, a national staff that, that can kind of track where things are in the pipeline I think is critical. Um, I'm not sure if that answered your questions, but there's a couple of observations. I, I think it, it partly does. Um, Vince, I'm going to go to you. We're, we're going to talk about the compact. What, and I've read recently some news accounts of an organization that, that had some concerns about it. Can you help address that, some of those concerns, with the, the unfounded rumors and, and what really the compact does represent as an opportunity for all of us? Sure, absolutely. I think going back to, the, to everything that we have in common, a, a compact truly takes all those elements that are similar and go across state lines that all of us are reaching for that are, that are goals of the industry and puts them into one document, allows us to go towards more uniformity, greater consistency. Um, it's no different than a interstate compact that governs the Mississippi River Delta. Um, every state where the Mississippi River runs through is a part of the compact, and it's the same whether you put in a boat in Minnesota or New Orleans. You have the same um, set of rules and guidelines uh, regardless of, of where you're at. And um, 
it should be no different for our industry that if you're racing in Iowa or Kentucky or Arkansas or New York that you have uh, you have a set uh, number of things that you know are common to those states. And I think that the goal of the compact uh, from a inception standpoint is to is to start small. Um, it's not a be all end all solution. It's not a magic bullet by any stretch. Uh, but I think it's important to take all the things that we do have in common, uh, a number of the 99% the of the non-controversial issues that we have in our sport uh, that help govern our sport, that help regulate our sport, and to put that in a single document. That there's no reason why those things shouldn't uh, transfer across state lines and be uniform as we go through things. And I think that would allow us to go towards the goal of the oversight without intervention so that um, the goal is to show both state and federal government that we're making the strides, that we're doing the job on our end uh, to create uniformity, create consistency, uh, so that we uh, don't force them to intervene. We don't, uh, we don't create a need for them to intervene. A couple speakers have already touched on bringing things the speed of which we bring reform to our industry. Wendy, you talked about, you're, I think you're one of the few speakers that spoke about keeping to a timeline. Um, we know that in 2008 we were faced with um, uh, probably uh, one of the most unique events, series of events that we've ever faced and, and it created a sense of urgency. What, um, how does the compact help speed things up if, if indeed it does? Vince, could you comment on that? Well, I think it, create, I think it creates a process uh, as much as anything. I mean, right now we have um, so many various silos within the industry that I think a compact would create a process for us to have the discourse. It would create a robust committee structure so that things are put on a timeline. Uh, as part of the regulatory structure within each state, you have uh, certain timelines and rules that have to be met from a posting of a rule. And if there, you have public comment periods, and so it forces, it forces that action uh, so that so that you have a, a up or down vote basically um, for for an issue, and I think you know none of us change a lot of times unless we have to. Uh, but if we're faced with a faced with a decision and we know that we have to make a decision by a certain point, it helps us talk it through, helps us figure out what the best solution is, and kind of forces us down the funnel, so to speak. And a compact, uh, that's not only the goal, but that's the purpose of the compact, is to force you down that funnel on those issues uh, so that you have a set process that everybody knows that is, that is public, that is noticed, so that you, you can make sound, quick decisions. And I promise I'd let you expand on the compact and how your organization uh, uh, would support it. Would you would you share it with that uh, us that please? Well, I think the thing that <clears throat> to remember with a compact is the the proposed legislation, the model legislation that's been uh, developed uh, uh, by RCI and the Council of State Governments uh, with with very productive and meaningful input from Keeneland and the NTRA and the USTA and the National HBPA and a variety of others uh, is nothing more or less than government reorganizing how government can work to be potentially more efficient, more uniform, more consistent, and the potential creation of a mechanism to possibly eliminate some redundancy that occurs from state racing commission to state racing commissions. Uh, the, the complaints over the years have been pretty much the same. If I race in this state, I have to do it this way. If I go to this state, I have to do it this way. And uh, it's a quality of life issue for many horsemen. Uh, and sometimes we can get an agreement on a model rule, and there's a lot of reasons why that model rule may not make it to the books of an individual jurisdiction, some of which is that uh, the local groups in that state may not agree with the consensus that was reached nationally. By creating a mechanism for the states to act collectively on a consideration and the implementation of a rule might not work as fast as a model rule process does because what would happen is Remy would, would, would have to make sure his, all his locals had the opportunity to be heard on that as well. And 
anybody so you're centralizing that whole process and in doing that you're actually saving some money and providing a certain degree of uniformity I totally agree with Vince the, the probably over 90 percent of the, the the issues that could be accomplished by creating a uniform rule book are totally non-controversial I think you get total agreement on, on, on a lot of that stuff uh, there are some issues that, that people won't agree with and that may have to be left to the individual commissions to sort out with the with the uh, with the constituencies in their individual states but the, the one thing we, we we do know is the state budgets are extremely tight and the commissions have a collective responsibility to to license to adjudicate to drug test and to uh, set standards and enforce those standards and uh, that's a that's a partnership with the industry in many ways because this industry survives uh, because of the, the the public assurance the consumer confidence we, we collectively need to give our fans and that goes to Alex's point so we've, we've looked long and hard at this and uh, we feel that this is a very uh, very positive reform that, that frankly we probably all should have done 10 years ago but better late than, than never Jim. I mean, do you want to respond? I know you have some meetings coming up in July. Uh, is this an agenda item for the horsemen? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, it is. Um, uh, probably a year ago, we formed a, a working group. Uh, we, we have several uh, very uh, talented attorneys of our, of our own, Frank Petromalo in, uh, in Virginia, um, uh, Bill Wamsley, Arkansas, who was a legislator, um, a lot of experience. So. We looked at the at the compact at the legislation thoroughly, read it line by line, and that that was the best practice that we could have done to kind of uh, allay some of the initial fears that our horsemen had, which was namely that that this is going to be a process for a, a runaway regulator to try to push through uh, rules that uh, weren't weren't agreed to by horsemen. Uh, we we and then what we're going to do is on the 22nd we're going to have a forum. At our meeting, and, and Ed will be there, and, and um, Rick Goodell, and we're going to have a balanced debate about the pros and cons about of the racing compact. Um, that being said, I think initially some of the things that that um, uh, you know are the concerns are number one, if the compact doesn't happen, where do we go from there? I think that this industry ought to take the lessons of this debate we're having about a new consensus building process and, and adapt it in some ways to what we already have. Now, we talk about a, a, a national rule book. Um, every country in the world has a, a national set of, of rules. We have 30 different states. We can't get away from that. We have different, but what we do have, and I talked to Mike a little bit about it, is um, commission books. You know, why couldn't we also approach the idea and talk to some racing sectors about common rules, everyday rules that horsemen read about in their condition books that say, you know, you know uh, simple rules that we can unify in a, in a, in a very usable uh, way for horsemen every day. Uh, for example, paperless full certificates is something we've been talking about. What we get the majority of our states saying that's a great idea. Um, you know, when you have to ship in, when you have to ship out, all the different rules that can make life a lot easier for horsemen. We can do all that now. The, the problem we have is we have to work on making our process a little bit better. I, I, there's a lot of hard work with the RCI on getting these meetings together, but we, we, we've got to do better about identifying those rules we all agree on see where they're in place and bring them together regionally. You know, we have, the problem we have right now is no matter what we do as far as rules, we have, we're going to have competition for horses, we're going to have competition between tracks sometimes across state lines, sometimes in the state where they're going to be trying to track horses from each other and, and there's, there's a lot of, you know, structural problems that we have on, on a competitive basis between racetracks alone that will make it, you know, tough to get a lot of this done so so you're meeting in late July and and the compact will be an agenda item for consideration by the national HPPA and and it's your your 
belief that having now read it, which is it's it's you know the two things you never want to do: make sausage and read legislation. Uh, is is un is you now feel that you can you can go back to your members and allay some of their initial concerns about a, 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 a you know a, a legislator or a regulator that's running away on on subjects. Exactly. We're gonna we're gonna have a, a balanced uh, forum. We're gonna have uh, a good debate with people who understand the compact, and we're also gonna have concerns that some people might have about it. So that. I, we haven't taken a position on it either way. Our idea is by having this forum, we can bring that to our, our board of directors, uh, you know, a motion or some kind of action um, when it meets us to where the position is going to be on the compact. Certainly, since 2008, uh, the sense of urgency has been in, in, certain, in the state of the industry now, certain cent central Kentucky, where we see indicators of. Uh, um, uh, uh, a, a number of economic indicators that are going the wrong way. Um, the sense of urgency remains. Alex, can you just give a, li a little bit of a history lesson on the tactics that we have used in the past? Now, the compact is a new tactic and it may be a very inclusive tactic, but from your position in this industry, what are some of the tactics that have been used in the past and, and, and how have they been successful? You're, you're thinking of implementation tactics. Implementation well, tactics, yes. Well, I think that uh, one of the things that the 2008 brought was something of a crisis in the industry about how do we accomplish reform? How, how, do we, how do we change things on a national basis, on a uniform basis? Because clearly that's what uh, the uh, death of eight bells and even the uh, steroid controversy surrounding uh, Big Brown, they both elicited extraordinary response from the public. And the question that came to us at the NTRA and really to the industry was, okay, now how are you going to change yourselves? You've got 38 jurisdictions, and if I heard that once, we heard it a thousand times. Um, what we did at the NTRA uh, was look around at a variety of different models that could be implemented and employed to, to, to bring the industry together uh, around a common set of, of, of ideas and principles. We looked at the federal, uh, the federal legislative model, and we considered that for a while, but because it's too expensive, because it would be a second set of rules, and a variety of other reasons, and including the, the lack of real interest on the part of Congress in, in dealing with the hard issues of our business. We looked at the league concept, where we would all come together and form a league and, and set rules, which we found to be problematic because we, we frankly, we couldn't get agreement among organizations in the industry, the, the ownership interests, is certainly not around commercial issues or even around regulatory issues. Um, so we looked at a variety of different ways that we could go about it, and what we seized upon uh, was in the, in the near term, uh, the best, quickest way for us to proceed and to pursue real uh, common reform around the country was to bar from education in, 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 a, in, a, in a medical field and use an accreditation model. It's been done in so many different businesses, especially those that are faced with or trying to stave off federal intervention. Well, they step in and they create a, a self-regulatory model. They determine the rules under which they want to compete, uh, and then they accredit groups that actually are in compliance with those. And that's what the, the Safety and Integrity Alliance is that we formed. It is, first, a set of common principles, most of which we've talked about today, and based upon how this is going, many of which will be incorporated into that code of standards, uh, and many of which, and I, let me make this point real clear, I do not agree with I personally think the compact is a great idea. I've got members who've got problems with it. But the compact um, is great for legislating certain things. The compact will, will, as a governmental entity, will never deal with retirement issues. It will never deal with research. There will never be uh, McPeterson as a result of, of government uh, intervention. That's something that has to come from the industry. Those are best practices that, that have to be organic, that we have to create to demonstrate our commitment to the welfare and safety of our human ethylene athletes and the integrity of our game. So we commit, we, we come, uh, we create the, the Safety and Integrity Alliance. We hire Mike Ziegler, who has been ubiquitous here in the last couple of days, and he's been a great addition to the NTRA, and I'm, I'm, uh, we're glad to have him. Uh, but, but using that process, we're seeing a large number of tracks and horsemen come together around a core group of principles. Uh, and we're seeing change. 
Mike and I were talking last night, and he, he certainly outlined that in his remarks yesterday, but one example that is amazing about what we saw in, 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 at Sunland Park in, in New Mexico, which happens to be the home state of uh, Congress, uh, Senator Udall, who was one of the senators who actually inquired about the industry situation a couple of months ago with con uh, Congressman Whitfield. Um, the things that were accomplished at Summon Park as a result of, A, the, the desire to be accredited, uh, to be in compliance with the, the code, and the desire of the state government to make it such that they could be accredited was amazing. And that was the beauty of the alliance. It brought together the, the operators, the participants, the horsemen in the state, and the state government, and, the, and, and the, the regulators. And together they forged their own alliance. They brought in TCO2 testing. They actually adopted model rules and penalties on, on drugs and medications, WIP rules, uh, toe grabs, the, rule, the, the list goes on. But they did those things in, in conjunction. We moved it a long way. And you think, well, what's New Mexico? Well, it's New Mexico. That's a state. It's an important state, especially now uh, with with the, with the uh, alternative gaming that they have at the track. Uh, Bill Cash was just talking to us about what a resurgence they've had in, at Sunland Park in the last few years. Um, it's a great story, but it also demonstrates how together we can do lots of things, um, not just through the governmental structure, but also through this, I think they'd say self-governance, because it's unlike, the alliance is unlike other self-governing models. Uh, think of when you go to the theater, GP, G, RX, all that's a self-governing model. That doesn't, that's not done by the government. That was done by the, the movie industry to stave off government censorship because they were going to come in and say, we're going to tell you what's a good movie and what's a bad movie. What's the, you know, we're going to set the lines unless you do. So they did that. That's a purely self-regulatory model. The alliance it fosters, comp it, it, it fosters debate and cooperation between the the, gov the, the regulated and the regulators, and I think it, that's why it's been a great model for us. It's complementary to the uh, to the um, to the compact, and ultimately, as we know, the compact can be opted out of by individual states. So there's no guarantee we get uniformity through the through the compact, but the alliance will be a, an important tool to bring people into compliance with that compact over time. So I, I think um, I think it was the right thing to do in the circumstances. It's proven to be the right thing. And, uh, and, and I, I look forward to, to providing that tool uh, to the industry as the compact hopefully moves forward and we do create, create that structure. So we've talked about model rules as one method of implementation that's had uh, a, a quite a bit of success, but not as much as we'd like. We've, we've proposed the compact as, a, as another method of, of uh, furthering uh, with more efficiency the promulgation of rules uniformly applied or, 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 uh, or adopted. Um, the alliance, the interior alliance in its brief history has already brought a number of, um, uh, of tracks and jurisdictions online with an accreditation process. Just to mention the Graded Stakes Committee with its positions on super tests, the mandatory PCO2 testing, anabolic steroids all help advance agendas uh, in reforms in our industry, and, and the Breeders' Cup likewise, uh, with uh, penalties including lifetime bans for certain violations. Those are all tactics we've, we've put at play. Lisa, turning to you and, and the, the Racing Commission being a, uh, a leader in these areas in, in recent times, tell us what, what's the next horizons for the Racing Commission? What, what's some, what are some of the, the things that you guys have given some consideration to? Right. Um, every month I get our staff together and we put together a list of priorities and it's about a six page list um, and at, during that same meeting we also list our accomplishments which makes everybody feel better about how hard we're working and how much we are accomplishing. Um, we have some short term goals and some long term goals. One of the things we uh, are going to be focusing on next will be wagering integrity matters. We just hired a supervisor of pyramidal wagering. He came on board in December, and so we'll be doing some things along that line. Um, we have the authority now to license ADWs and license code companies, so regulations along that line will be going through the process, um, I hope, pretty soon. Uh, the Equine Drug Research Council looked recently at the McKenzie Report and made some recommendations, so those regulations need to be drafted. 
We're looking at the out-of-competition rule, want to draft that, get that in place. So we, we always have a lot of things bubbling around. Very good. Vince, going back to you again as our, our relatively newcomer in this business, what would be your recommendations? You talked about the, the specifics of the compact, but when you look out at this, this group of very dedicated uh, individuals that, that have a chance to go out and talk to their constituencies, and what would, what would be the one recommendation you would give, or more than one, you're welcome to, uh, about how we could see implementation and, and some of these reforms sure. adopted? And the biggest thing, I think, is to focus on the positive. Uh, I mean, so much in, in my relative short experience in the industry is that we get so focused on um, the things that we're doing wrong or the things that are, that are problems with the sport, and this is a fabulous sport. Um, it's a, a just increasingly interesting business, I mean, day by day, and it's, it's a phenomenal sport um, that we have the ability to market and to sell and to show to the world. Uh, and there's a few other sports that have the global demand that we do, the global reach that we do, um, and I think it's important for us as messengers uh, to show that enthusiasm. I mean, we all are fortunate enough to be in this business, and uh, there's no reason why we should be downtrodden about the future. Um, there's not a there's not an industry, there's not a segment of the population that's not going through tough times right now. I mean, we're not immune from that, um, and we should we should relish the opportunities that it that it gives us uh, to be positive and take that message out. And and to that point, from a from a rulemaking standpoint or, or some of the wonderful things that the, that the commission here in Kentucky is involved in, um, we ought to focus on those things that that are true positives that we can build upon. Uh, you know, the, the fact that this is the third summit uh, says that we have uh, some great some great achievements already. Uh, and, and there's always more to do. There's, you know, as, as Nick put it yesterday, it's, it's about gaining momentum and, and using that and trumping those positives to, to achieve more. Agree. Ed? Tell us about a uh, similar question to you, and, and, and how would you look to build upon that, the momentum that you wrote about, Alex and I also wrote about in our, in our responses back to Congress? Well, I think uh, processes like the one we've, we've all been through past day and a half are, are very, very productive. Um, I, 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 the compact is, I would hate to see a meaningful reform of how government functions and the regulation of this sport gets stalled uh, by people in the industry uh, who may not fully grasp it or may have other beats. I, I've, I learned early on that when you're a regulator, you're, you're never the most popular person at the party. You, you, sometimes you're standing in the back of the room, nobody wants to talk to you. Uh, and there are regulatory decisions that are made, either in individual cases or in terms of a rule, that have are, are going to make some people happy and are going to make some people mad. And but at the end of the day, the regulators are the ones that the public pays to wear the white hats to make impartial calls on things. And sometimes we get it right, and sometimes we don't. But we always try to get it right. What we've come forward with is a reform to help implement these type of reforms that are discussed here in a uniform and consistent way. It doesn't give the government any power it, not now, it does not now have. It doesn't take away any power. And there are people who would say, we don't want your regulators doing this or doing that. And this wouldn't be the time to debate that. These, this, you read the compact law, it's a, just a minor extension of existing state racing laws. And it is a recommendation by the government agencies that have looked at this as to what they believe they need to be have as an option and a tool for them to perform their job more efficiently. And there's a bill pending in New York in the New York legislature as we speak. It is being opposed by a standard bred horsemen's association up there. I can't predict what's going to happen, but the rhetoric that's being used in opposition to this bill is not consistent with what is in that bill. <clears throat> and it's, it's a shame that this could, this type of minor reform that could have a, a, a positive impact to implementing needed improvements in this sport 
um, could get derailed over over politics. So I would just say, Jim, that the the this is an opportunity right now over the next I'd say next two years um, to 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 for this industry to come together and try to do something positive to address long-standing complaints. And I realize everybody's got constituencies they need to represent. And we, we pegged 2010 as kind of a, a year that we would focus on helping people understand this. And I'm very glad that Remy's got this panel coming up out, out, out there because I'd hate to see uh, I'd hate to see this get politicized and, and, and stalled in the state legislatures because I don't know that there is another option. Alex, you, you looks like you want to make comments. Yeah, I just want to I want to uh, support Ed in his concern because this compact is far from a done deal. There is there is still much work to be done. Uh, it needs to be implemented. That is passed in six states for it to become operational. Uh, and there aren't six states right now where we can pass it. And it's in part due to exactly the kind of dynamics that Ed is talking about, which is. People who are very local, very local in their focus, and very local in their orientation. And it is sort of part and parcel of what we are about in horse racing, and we perceive ourselves to be ultimately a local concern. But with the rise of simulcasting, with the media, with the internet, uh, we have to start looking at ourselves as a national and even an international business. And it only stands to reason that we use every method possible to to create that statewide or the national approach to our regulatory authorities. And doing it through the state government is, I think, much more efficient and will ultimately be more satisfactory than any federal initiative that we could ever pursue. And ultimately, what I hope this industry comes to the conclusion, one that our friends in the casino industry figured out long ago, uh, they realized that they can use regulation and integrity as a real marketing tool. And so 20 years ago, there were casinos in what? Two states? You had them in Nevada and New Jersey. Today, you have racinos in 15 states. You have some form of casino gambling in 30 or more states. One of the ways they grew themselves geographically was by demonstrating to the public that they had the toughest regulation possible, that they were serious about cheating, they were serious about all the integrity issues that had always haunted casino gambling. And they used that to their advantage and racing needs to do that because there's a real uh, there's a real sales tool to our fans that, that the regulators can provide us and we'll never be able to establish that on our own. That's why the Alliance is not a purely self governing organization. We are supportive of state government and of state regulation because we think that gives fans the ultimate confidence they want. So uh, I hats off. I personally, I have to say organizationally, the NTRA has not been able to get consensus on this issue. Personally, I think it's a good idea, but we've got work to do internally. And so each of you, uh, if you're so inclined, we need your ambassadorship wherever you are and whatever your station is in this business because it's a, it's a, it's a hurdle we've got in front of us. I mean, I think it's also important to note, you know, does everybody realize that we actually have a compact out there right now? We have a licensing compact that's been around for, what, 10 years. Uh, you can today, if you're a trainer, get all your owners together and license them at one time, pay one fee, do one set of fingerprints, and you're done. Now, we've had meetings where, you know, we talk about the simple normal rules that we can make lives easier for owners and trainers and they, and they keep on bringing up, well, what about licensing? I said, guess what? There is a compact. There is a, a rule where you can do it all at once and said, I've got a stack of licenses in my office from my racetrack here is that, you know, is, is, is this high? Now, why is it that we we haven't been successful in getting that to work? Well, I think that it's education. That's I, you know, I take the blame for that. I try to explain to our horsemen you can license your owners at one time. But there's also the, the fact that when we talk about implementation, and Ed, I know, will we'll agree that, you know, we, we're dealing with, uh, you know, if you're licensing in, in for, for three states, you're still going to pay the license fees for those three states. It's, it's, it's how the racing commissions will, will, 
you know, bring in the revenues and all that. But, you know, we have a, a, an, an existing compact out there that we haven't been successful in, in, in making work. We, we have to find a better way of implementing that. And maybe by having a national, you know, you know wagering uh, and, and racing compact might bring up the idea that we can, can do the licensing. A simple thing like licensing on a national basis would be a wonderful way to, to sell this. Um, when I talked to Bill Walmsley, one of our um, uh, long-standing HBPA presidents, and he suggested that the compact would be a great idea. Why don't we have a, a six-month moratorium on issues we know we're going to be this, you know, divisive? Let's just maybe put that off for a while on controversial medication issues and things like that. And, and the first six months, just address basic day-to-day -day rules that we all know we could we could pass, we can put it together and, and get it done and get it done, you know, in multiple states to show that we can succeed, that we can actually do this this thing. And and I think the licensing compact is a, is a great example of that, is that, you know, it, there's a wonderful tool we have and we just we haven't been successful in in in, in, in making it work. And and I take part of the blame for that with, with horsemen who you know, just, you know, they're resistant for whatever reason on, you know, doing that. They'd rather sit, sit, sit on 12 different lines <laughs> to get their licenses done. But, but we have a, we have a, a great example there. Well, it, it, that always brings me to one of my favorite uh, analogies. <clears throat> we often try to hit the uh, three-run homer, as Earl Weaver subscribed to for years. But um, truly the best way to score the runners is to, is to hit singles. And, and perhaps, uh, Remy, after your meeting and, and hopefully your organization's um, uh, commitment to move forward with the, the compact, an early part of those agendas would be to put aside uh, some of the more ambitious things, but let's accomplish what we can today. Let's hit those singles so we can start moving the runners and we can demonstrate to, the, to, to those that watch us closely, those that are concerned about the regulation and the health and safety and welfare of racehorses and, and participants, that we can achieve more. Uh, I'll take Vince's comment. Um, I thought that was really right on. We have accomplished an awful lot as an industry, as a group, just in the last couple of years, but over, gosh, all of our lifetimes, we have made steady progress. We should be proud of that steady progress, and we should be committed to continue it. Um, if it pleases the panel, I'll, I'll try to wrap up, and, and unless there's any questions from the audience. And I'd like to ask each of you, um, and I'll start off with you, Remy. Just acting with that sense of urgency that we all feel about the future of our business. Oh, Matt's got a couple of questions. Why don't I do those questions first? Is that okay? Before we come to that, I'll, uh, I'll run through these questions. I was looking for uh, a couple of those. Um, question, and I'll, I'll open it to the panel. Um, until the compact is up and running, which may take a, a, a period of time. What other short-term implementation ideas um, would you recommend? Well, go ahead. <laughs> um, well, I, 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 an example is uh, you know paperless uh, horse pulse or certificate um, identification. We that was brought to our executive committee. Everybody agreed. We we did a survey. We got uh, 22 of our uh, 25 surveys back saying that's a great idea. I've met with Matt and, and, and we're ready to move forward and, and push our local racing commissions to make that a, a, a racing rule where, listen, if I'm a trainer and I'm driving from with a horse van, you know, from Philadelphia Park to Penn National and I forgot my my uh, jockey club full certificates, you know, that's, we ought to be able to get past having to have those papers on file for your horse to remain eligible for a race. We, we can do that. We have the technology. That's one rule that ought to be a, a, an easy one to do. Um, licensing, I just mentioned. Um, uh, some day-to-day -day rules were when a horse has to be on the grounds, uh, ship in, ship out. Um, there's a lot of stuff you can find in condition books. If we gathered about 15 condition books, we can, I can guarantee you find you know, uh, a dozen rules that are close to being the same, 
but are not and should be, should be the same, you know, whether you're in Indiana or in Kentucky or, or elsewhere. So uh, I think that they're there. I, I can come up with a long list, but we'll probably do that when we meet in July. Very good. Ed, here's a question for you. Does the industry, can either, can Jim, can I, Sorry, I'm sorry. please ask. <laughs> Frustratingly, the answer, I think, to this question is the alliance. That is what the alliance is. It is a short-term implementation strategy that we're, that we're pushing forward today. It's making changes today. Uh, whether the compact exists or not, the alliance is con continuing its efforts, and it will continue its efforts. And that's what it's about. It's about implementation of the things that we all agree about. Ed, does the industry need to approach the individual racetracks to begin lead more leadership with regard to the model rules process? Is that, is that a, a tactic that should be further explored and, and they, they should be brought more into the process? Uh, we notify the, uh, the various associations that represent the tracks, uh, TRA, the HTA, the uh, quarter horse tracks, uh, the uh, Greyhound tracks. Um, the choice to participate in the process is totally up to those organizations. Um, uh, our door is always open and, and frankly we had an aud a paramutual auditors committee meeting in Indianapolis a couple of weeks ago. and. Uh, Chris Scherf uh, came and uh, made a tremendous contribution to that dialogue and that process, and that, that uh, I think the tracks uh, definitely uh, should be at the table, uh, very much so. Uh, uh, I would hope uh, in our steering committee that the, uh, uh, the TRA would, would, would become involved in that. We're very appreciative for the input from a track perspective that we received from, from Vince on, on, on behalf of Keeneland. Uh, but, uh, uh, yeah, I think the tracks could, uh, I think they, have, they are a very important voice and I think they uh, definitely should be at the table. Uh, we agree. We, we had a chance to talk to tracks often and, and I, I think there's um, a great opportunity um, for there to be more dialogue, direct dialogue with, with them and we certainly would encourage it and we'd ask all of you in your constituencies to, to encourage it as well. Um, Lisa, can you can you share with us uh, can you uh, the six steps of success? Okay. Can you can you share that? I, I got to be part of them. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, I started out the first one was to start at the top where we have a supportive governor um, and a supportive commission who are very um, active and well educated in the industry. Second was to hire good people. The third was to have an active commission and an active committee structure. Um, and I think I got about halfway through that. I talked about the Equine Drug Research Council, um, working on the ban on anabolic steroids and the Safety and Wel Welfare Committee, um, spearheading efforts to ban front toe grabs, safety vest rule, safety helmet rule, softer riding crop rule, and a standard bread whipping rule. And a couple of those, such as the safety vest rule, Kentucky implemented them and then we took it to the Model Rules Committee and they approved it as well. So some of the rules we implement, we take on to the Model Rules Committee, did the same thing with the standard bread whipping rule. Um, we also have a wagering integrity subcommittee, so that's the committee who will be working on the parimutuel rules I mentioned, such as licensing the tow companies and the ADWs. And then we have a rules committee that Ned Bonnie chairs, and that is sort of the cleanup committee that gets anything that doesn't fall under one of those specific committees. So they've just looked at things like jockey advertising and licensing regulations to license individuals and racetracks. The fourth key to success would be to involve the industry groups in formulating the rules and implementation. Um, you always end up with a better rule if you've listened to your constituents' needs, um, what's on their mind. Um, they may not always get 100% of what they request, but we do try to work with everybody. And you'll also find that there's less pushback when you go in front of the legislature. The fifth key to success is to prioritize. We have, as I mentioned earlier, we have so many things on our plate. I've got that six page list and you can't do them all at one time. So you've got to pick your, pick your spots. Um, priorities are set by the governor by the legislature, for example, we have a legislator who asked us to license ADWs. 
the commission, of course. The industry will make requests. Um, we just talked about working with trucks. Um, Keeneland, Turfway, and Churchill Downs came to us asked us for, to amend the rule on paying out purses so that we would wait, we could um, authorize them to wait to pay out purses until the drug results are back. And we went, went along with that, thought it was a good idea. We were able to do that pretty quickly. Sometimes events alter priorities. You know, that, that's just going to happen in 2008. Probably a lot of priorities were changed. Um, then our sixth key to success is something we've heard throughout the, um, the summit, and that is that it's a continual process. We are always going to be working to try to make things better. I know Nick said that repeatedly. We'll never be done. Um, I think the industry really pulled together after eight bells went down, and I hope that we will continue pulling together. It's helped us be able to move a little faster because we had so much cooperation because there was a sense of urgency, and I hope we'll maintain that sense of urgency. Very good. Any others from the floor? Uh, I know <clears throat> questions could be brought to Matt. Okay, we'll go back to our conclusion then. Remy, I'm going to come right back to you. Um, I, and, and Lisa, thank you for that uh, urgency, urgency, uh, and momentum. So acting with that sense of urgency, this is your constituency here. You've got seven countries, more than a thousand people in addition to this room, what do you want to tell them about your organization's commitment and, and what you want them to carry as a message out of today? Well, uh, what I would say is um, I came to the HBPA in 2001 after working in track management for about 18 years and, you know, uh, I think what we've done in, in, in the years since is I think if we, if we raise the level of, of of the conversation, that's why we focus on having forums, having good debates with all sides. Uh, I try to, whether it's a, a contract negotiation with a horseman's group or the racetrack, <coughs> I try to make sure they understand that, you know, come to, come prepared, know your subject matter, have a have a good rapport as opposed to, you know, reacting in, you know, immediately one way or the other. You know, we, we try to have a, a good, solid, uh, uh, you know, debate within our organization on, on important issues. I, I think uh, through our, the leadership of Joe Santana, our national president, and our other uh, presidents before him, we, we've co come a long way in, you know, being, being very uh, uh, progressive in our industry. Um, we have a lot of... Um, Lawyers, doctors, uh, we have a lot of owners. Uh, you know, it's it's not the HBPA of old. You know, we we're engaged, and uh, so what would you tell us? And and I think that what I would say is that um, as far as implementation, as far as today's topic, we have an opportunity to get a lot done. Uh, but the opportunity may come and go uh, if we don't take advantage of it. Um, you know, the industry has changed since I came into the sport, and I think uh, it's. For the, it's better now than it was back in the late 70s when I started, you know, scalping horses and all that. And we have a unique opportunity now, uh, as far as our rulemaking process and as far as uh, our, uh, how we uh, address that. But we won't get too many chances at the plate on this. We have to get it right this time, otherwise uh, we'll lose a lot of support from the horsemen. Ben, same question, if I may. From an urgency standpoint, I think it's a mindset, Jim. Uh, you know, it's all of us are here because we want to be, and I think that the uh, the principles that we come up with, the ideas we come up with, are things that that guide us, are, are stuff that we uh, should be guided by what we should do and what we want to do rather than what we have to do. And, and I think that's one of the biggest points with with the congressional oversight is is they're pushing us, um, and we have to be careful that we don't get forced to do things that we have to do, and we need to take it upon ourselves. Uh, to do the things that we should do and, and we want to do because it's the right thing, right thing as an industry uh, to be practicing. Very good. Ed? I spent nine years of my life uh, working in the U.S. Senate. And there's one thing I learned during those nine years. When there's a blip on the radar screen, if you don't address it, it just potentially gets bigger and bigger and bigger 
and bigger. There's a blip on our radar screen. There are interest groups who are advocating the creation of a federal regulator for this sport. Your state regulators have come to you as an industry, opened the door, put people at the table, and said, help us reorganize how we do business. We think we can do better if we can not be runaway regulators, as Remy used that term all too often, Remy. <laughs> if we had this as an option, it's also potentially addresses that blip on the radar screen. I can tell you that you have rule promulgation going on in all the states. And more often than not, and Kentucky's probably the exception because you have a very engaged constituency in this state. But I will tell you from the nine years I was executive director of the New York State Racing and Wagering Board, we put rules out, important rules out for public comment. And nobody would comment. Nobody would comment. So what we've put on the table is an idea to put everybody at the table to maybe institutionalize a public-private partnership in policy formation as to how things would come up, then to give everybody the opportunity to comment. So we end up with maybe runaway regulations, but if people didn't take the opportunity that they now have under the statute to impact on the development of that public policy, that's something that nobody really talks about in this industry. And I would say the urgency issue, Jim, is we need to realize that we have an opportunity right now to restructure some of this, to create that option, and we shouldn't miss it. Because you know what will happen? The, the state budgets are extremely tight. So a concept like this, where you could potentially eliminate redundancies, is very attractive to state budget directors right now. Now, I would take that opportunity. I wouldn't miss it. And that would be uh, the only thing I'd have to say. Thanks, sir. Lisa, same question. Okay. Um, my two takeaway points would be, one, I think the compact is a really good idea. I served on the steering committee that has been reviewing this for, I guess, over a year and helped um, amend some of the language so that we thought it would be scalable among the various jurisdictions. I think it would be a great thing for Kentucky. Um, I've talked to the governor's office about it. They're interested. And I, one of my next steps will be to talk to the commissioners individually about it. Um, obviously, there's an education component here where we, I need to go person to person and talk to them about what I think that can do for us. I've, you all have heard me go on and on about what things we have on our plate and the process we go through, this would really help us, I think, to move things along quicker. My second point uh, is to maintain that sense of urgency. We all worked so well together a few years ago and over the last few years, and I hope we will maintain um, that uh, sense of trying to help move the industry forward in a positive manner and working together. Thank you. Honestly, I think I've forgotten the question, but I'm going to give you an answer. So, um, do you want to tell everyone, Alex? <laughs> first of all, first off, I would I would say that this has once again been a great experience for me to watch and listen to people wrestle with important issues. Uh, the, the fact that all of you have taken time out of your schedules to come to Lexington to to participate in this third summit is a testament to how important this industry uh, considers these issues. And so we're already ahead of the game because we're hosting now the third summit. Obviously, we can't pat ourselves on the backs too much because it's one thing to talk about them. It's another thing to actually do them. Implementation is a, is a huge challenge. But one of the things that I think all of us who were participating in the, in the effort to respond to the, the congressional inquiry in the last couple of months, one of the things that, that we were all struck with was the complementary nature of the very successful efforts that are taking place at the Jockey Club, 
through all the efforts of the, Wel the Welfare and Safety Summit and the Safety Committee and all the good recommendations and good science that we have now that we didn't have even a year ago and, and how good it was to be able to stand up to, to Congress and say, oh, the questions we had two years ago, we now have answers. But now, I mean, we may not like the answers, we may need more data, but we've got some important answers to the questions. So we have important research term in this industry who's stepping up and giving us uh, the, the information we need and the opportunities like this to, to debate. Uh, the, the NTRA safety and integrity lines. And going through the process, frankly, I was amazed at how much progress we had made with those, with those tracks and horsemen that are involved. And that's an important uh, key element to remember here because reform happens in this industry only when the tracks embrace it. That Keeneland is unto itself. Keeneland is, is visionary beyond most tracks in this country. We need many, many more tracks in this room. We need many more tracks involved in this effort. The alliance is an opportunity to bring them together, and we have 18 tracks that have embraced it, and others that will. That's the key of the alliance. It brings tracks into the process so that they move this ball forward, because without them, frankly, it's very difficult in this industry. Lastly, what the, what the, the regulators are doing through the compact is a huge step forward. And I've already said enough about that issue. You know where, where I stand, but there's work to be done. The three together, though, the three complementary efforts that we have are truly that. They're positive. They're forward-thinking. You're part of that. Your comments and the work of the committee is ongoing because I understand you know how four standing committees dealing with these issues. That's going to be so helpful for us uh, in, in so many ways. So I applaud your efforts, uh, and I think we do have a good story to tell, but we also have work to do. And that's where we need the urgency. Uh, and, I, and, and I think we just have to keep our minds on the fact that ultimately the fans are looking for this. And if that doesn't make us urgent, uh, I don't know what will. I think that's very well said, Alex. And I thank everyone uh, in this panel and those that have asked questions and, and for your attention today. I just want to leave you with, with three thoughts. And it's, I believe it's a summary. It's a, it's a capsulation of what's been said here. First, be engaged. Stay engaged. Don't leave here and let your mind go back to the daily events that we all uh, are involved in. Stay engaged. Participate. Second, and this is the thing that, 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 that's so uplifting about meetings like this, work together. Continue to work together, not just within your sphere, but these committees that are established have a broad representation. Continue to reach out. Continue to work together. And finally, the next point, let's keep up the momentum. It's been tremendous. The chance for the three of us to write that response to Congress back in May and to point out the actual, true, factual steps that have been taken uh, was fantastic. And we need to continue to demonstrate that we're, we're committed to the, that momentum. We're committed to the good reasons, the good science that, that this, this summit has represented. And and we're, we're working together. So with that, I thank you for a, 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 a today. And uh, if there's any further questions, we'll sign off. Thank you all.